Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Today, I have with me a very, very well-established, well-known author, Christopher C. Doyle with me. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ashutosh. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, Chris is the best-selling author of the Mahabharata Secret, uh, the, the Mahabharata Quest, the Alexander Secret, the Secret of the Druids. He's also got a book titled The Patal Prophecy, Son of Brigu, Mists of Brahma. His other avatar is he's the founder of the Growth Catalysts. He's worked for several MNCs. He's from IAM Calcutta and he sits on several boards. So Chris, tell me, what would you say are three key milestones in your life or career? So that's a, that's a very interesting uh, question, Ashutosh, because I guess different people have different ways of looking at milestones. And for me, the way I look at milestones are things that I, you know, I would remember and take with me to the end of my days. Events which have in some way shaped my life. So for me, I think the three milestones, and I'm mixing both personal and, and other uh, milestones together. Mm-hmm. So I think the first milestone was was my marriage. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a wonderful relationship. I have a, a wonderful supporting partner. We've been married now for almost twenty six years, mm-hmm. and I think that's been a very very big event that shaped my life. My daughter's birth for me is another big milestone because indirectly, I mean, apart from the joy of having a child and bringing mm-hmm. her up, indirectly she was responsible for me eventually writing a book and getting published. So. Okay apart from the other delights, uh, you know, that she's provided through uh, her life with us. Correct. And I think the third milestone for me is a childhood dream, which I cherished. And that was becoming a, a pub- published author, seeing my, my name among those of my literary idols. And for me, that was a big one, which happened in 2030. So Terrific. these are my three milestones. Terrific. So let's talk first about, uh, you know, and I know you work for many companies, but let's focus today initially on your journey as an author. So let's start with the, your telling me about your books. So I like to think of myself as someone who, who provides uh, my readers with a mix of, or a blend of things. So, mm-hmm. so I, I give them a little bit of uh, information about, about our mythology. Mm-hmm. I give them a little information about history. Mm-hmm. I give them a pretty strong dose of science, mm-hmm. and 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 I and I weave all of this into into a tale which is set in modern times, and uh, so there's suspense and action. So it's it's a thriller basically with these elements in it. So that's how I look at my writing. That's okay. that's what my books are about. Okay. And when did you start writing? You did mention that your daughter was one of the motivations for you to start writing. So I've been writing school since school days. Um, I've been writing stories since I was in school. I had lovely teachers who would come to me after the English language exam and say, did you write a story or did you write an essay? Because they wanted to read the story. Uh, so I've, uh, I've always been writing, but uh, seriously, I began, uh, I really began churning out stories for my daughter when she was about three years old. I used to tell her my own bedtime stories, you know, make them up for her. Mm-hmm. And in most of them, she was the heroine of the, of the story. And, uh, when she was about seven, she wanted, you know, she came to me and basically told me to up my game because the uh, the kiddie stories I was telling her were, you know, she'd outgrown them. And, uh, and that's when I thought of, you know, coming up with this blend of history. She was very interested in history and mythology. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd always wanted to write about mythology. So I put it all together and started a story which lasted for two years every mm-hmm. night. So I would write bits of it and, and then, you know, narrate it to her. Mm-hmm. And that eventually became my first book. Okay. And which was the first book? Uh, the Mahabharat Secret. Wonderful. Wonderful. So tell me, you know, between science and technology, uh, mythology and history, what has made you blend these completely diverse topics into uh, a story? I mean, you know, mythology, people say, has nothing to do with science. History has nothing to do with mythology because history doesn't recognize mythology. Yeah, uh, that's a great question, actually. And what's, I guess what, what probably triggered my thinking in this direction was many, many years ago, uh, this is in the 90s, 
when I was uh, reading a lot of books and, and some of the books were written by Western authors mm -hmm. who were doing a lot of research into science and archaeology and trying to piece together bits of Western mythology using that. They were trying to explain the mythology using that. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, there's a very book, uh, good book that came out subsequently called Science and the Magical, mm -hmm. which looks at interpreting Greek mythology in terms of actual science. And it came out after I started writing. But uh, in the 90s, when I was reading this, I, I would often wonder how would this feel uh, if one applied it to Indian mythology? And, uh, and that's when my search began, the research and the reading, you know, detailed reading of, of, the, of the ancient texts in India. Uh, and when I started reading, I, you know, it was, it was really fascinating. And, you know, I could talk for hours about this, but I'll just give you one small example. The story of Shikandin, Shikandi, Shikandin, yeah. is something that can actually be explained by, by science, by genetics. Uh, a genetic mutation that, uh, that allows a, a person born as, as a girl to spontaneously change gender mm -hmm. at puberty and become a male. This is very well documented in the medical literature and it's a, it's a, it's a genetic mutation that causes this. Now, Correct. could this have been the reason behind that story? One doesn't know, but these were the conjectures with which I started. So that's how I tried to link science and mythology. Okay. And then history, um, fortunately, as a fiction writer, because I write fiction, uh, there are a lot, lot of loopholes in history, mm. uh, a lot of mysteries, lots of questions. Our history is not as well recorded as we would like to think, considering, you know, mm. the, the kind of, you know, the way we humans are. Mm. Uh, so uh, as a fiction writer, it was, uh, it was a, a very interesting challenge to see if I could actually connect dots mm -hmm. uh, using facts which were plausible, but not necessarily true. Okay. Interesting. So, you know, you said that you've been writing since the time you were very, very young. I have a question which says that, you know, what makes a good writer? I think reading. I think if anyone wants to be a good writer, you have to read a, a lot. I read a lot for every book. I read about 100 books uh, for every book I write. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I think it's because I've been reading since I was very small. I've had these glasses since I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. I think that's possibly the reason why I'm able to write at all. Mm. Uh, so I think that's that's the real secret of a good writer. And when you say reading, uh, reading any particular subjects or related to the kind of writing that you're going to do or just anything? Anything. Okay. Anything. The broader, the better. Because you read stuff you'd like, you read stuff you don't like, you learn a lot from what you read. Uh, you can read fiction, nonfiction, different genres of fiction. You pick up a lot of information, you pick up a lot of uh, learning, you, you see writing styles, you see character development. So I, I would, you know, I would say reading everything and anything. And uh, what makes a good story then? So I think the, as both as a reader, as an author, I think it's, it's very important to, to keep the reader hooked. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, I I know I'm successful as an author if if a reader writes into me and says I couldn't put your book down, mm. or I finished it in three hours flat, or or my mother was reading a book and she burnt dinner because of it, because that tells me that I've been able to keep the 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 reader glued to the book. And for me, I think uh, that's done by using a variety of different devices. But you're you're basically trying to you're basically trying to create suspense for the reader, uh, for the genre that I write, at least. Okay. And, um, and, 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 and the good kind of suspense, where people actually do want to know what happens next. Hmm. I think that's very key for the kind of books that I write. And a nail-biting page turner, is it? A nail-biting page turner. I didn't have to say it would have sounded very immodest if I said that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, next question to you is that, you know, when you, are, when you start writing, unless you write every day, you know, like some people tell me two hours every day. What is your work schedule like? So I don't write every day. Mm. Uh, in fact, I write less than I research. My writing is, is quite fast. I normally write, the actual writing maybe takes about two to three months. Mm -hmm. It's the research that takes years. So, uh, so I don't have a writing schedule as such. I, I do not write every day. Uh, mm -hmm. It's impossible given the fact that I've got a day job. So, uh, but I do a lot of research. So I try and, and read every day. I do, a, like I said, I do a lot of reading. So that's, that takes up most of the time. Right. But a typical work day would be, uh, would be, I think about 70% uh, to 80%, sometimes 100% work. 
mm-hmm. where I'm, I'm looking, you know, either with clients or preparing for, you know, uh, doing stuff for them. Or, you know, there may be a, a day, like some weekends when I would spend, uh, there have been times when I spend the whole night writing, a Saturday night, I sit down and write for 10 hours. And that's when a lot of stuff does get churned out. But typically a lot of, a lot of the day goes on work, actual work. Okay. And one more question on books before I move to the next segment. You know, this is the age of the millennials and the Gen Zs. As an author, what is your perception of the reading habits of the younger generation? I think, firstly, uh, the, the reading habit is, is not as strong as it possibly was in, you know, in our generation. I think it's, uh, there are so many distractions now which we didn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have more instant gratification. You have to sit down for three, four hours, maybe a week sometimes, depending on the kind of book you're reading. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's an effort. So, so that's one thing. But having said that, I think um, what, what I've learned through my books, at least, is mm-hmm. that if you write a good story and make it interesting for the younger generation, they will read it. Mm-hmm. My initial books, the Mahabharat Quest series, was not written was not targeted at a very young market. Mm. I mean, there's no one in that, in that book who's less than 30 years old. And, uh, and I was very surprised to find that people, uh, school children as young as 12 and 13 year olds, they were writing to me and saying, we loved your books. Wow. So, so that gives, gives me a lot of encouragement, a lot of hope that, uh, you know, there are youngsters out there who like mm. reading. I, I think it's also our responsibility of us as authors to give them really good stuff that they enjoy reading. Um, if they are motivated to write to an author and say, I loved your books, Correct. Uh, I think, I think then we, you know, we're doing something for them. Mm. Okay. So let's now move to uh, what you call your day job, you know, right. which is you know, the growth catalyst and coaching. I'm uh, assuming talk to me about the growth catalysts. So the growth catalyst is, is fairly recent, um, uh, you know, considering my journey, um, I've been coaching now for about 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, more as a passion, I would do it with, uh, with friends, with connects, you know, there would be uh, 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 CEOs would come to me mm-hmm. and say, you know, we want to talk. Mm-hmm. And I found myself talking to them, uh, but not really advising them, but helping them to find solutions to, you know, whatever they wanted to. And uh, then someone told me, a friend of mine told me, uh, you're actually coaching. And then I said, okay, if I'm doing that, and I, I, and I enjoyed doing it. So mm-hmm. I, I, I got trained, I underwent coach training, got myself certified as a coach, uh, and still carried on, you know, I, I was, I had a job, but I would do this, uh, you know, on weekends and stuff like that. And then in 2010, I decided that this was something that um, I wanted to pursue professionally as well. I thought this would be my this would really be my job. Okay. And uh, I'd, I'd also kind of got a little tired of, of being in, in big business. I'd worked for multinationals. I was running businesses. And, uh, and I just thought I'd strike out on my own and start off something on my, on my own. And um, I think there was also a bit of a, uh, my last job, I was running the Economist Intelligence Unit in India. Mm-hmm. And I think it was also a kind of, uh, I wanted to prove to myself that what I was doing or, or, you know, the doors that were opening, um, people were recognizing me not for the economist brand, but for me as a person. Correct. So I wanted to build something of my own. Correct. And, and that's when I, when I started working on my own. Initially, I, I, I did a joint venture with an American company, uh, which mm-hmm. was into coaching. Uh, but then I realized that, that they were moving more towards HR and organization development. And that's not my core competence. I'm a, I come from the business side of things. So, so I wanted to focus more on business. Mm-hmm. And so we parted ways and that's when the growth catalyst was, was born. Okay. So this is really a culmination of a journey, which is, you know, evolved. And, uh, and uh, I, I then, you know, when I realized that what I really wanted to do was to help uh, business leaders, uh, which I was doing anyway, one-on-one, but I also realized that I could, I could serve a lot more uh, organizations by working with the, org- the leadership team at the top. And that's really what the growth catalyst is about. We work with uh, the CEO and the top management and help them to enhance performance and grow the business. So the focus is very strongly on the business. Very interesting. So, you know, let's talk coaching a little bit. Uh, Traditionally in India, coaching was always done either by a boss who was 
who have taken a like liking to you or in a family business by an elder in the last few years coaching has become very formalized in india why do you think this is happening why are people willing to pay for coaching so i think it's 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 a, it's been a very interesting journey because i remember when i started on 2010 um, there was still a bit of a resistance to uh, to coaching mm-hmm. but over the last 10 years i've seen the, the change that you're talking about happening and i think there are a couple of reasons for this one is uh, like a lot of management trends uh, and business trends mm-hmm. we tend to follow the west mm-hmm. and the west uh, western business has had a fairly strong tradition of coaching mm-hmm. uh, all of my first clients Uh, you know in the first few years my, all my clients were were uh, american multinationals or you know western multinationals and uh, it's only in the last few years that you know i started getting uh, indian business owners and uh, large indian companies mm-hmm. so so i think there's been a rub off that's probably the first thing there's been a rub off from the western business world to to india mm-hmm. and i think the second thing is probably that there um, there are quite a few good coaches out there now who are actually um, who are actually delivering results mm. and uh, and people are realizing that coaching can can benefit earlier coaching had a very negative connotation to it mm. and a, a, a lot of people probably thought that oh if i'm being coached then i'm maybe on my way out mm. it's my last chance you know what they call the pip that has changed now and people now realize uh, i actually have you know ceos coming to me and saying yeah, I, i think i'd like you to work with me because I want to get to the next level, mm. and and that's where I think you can uh, you can really make a contribution. So people are realizing the benefits now. Correct, and therefore a follow up question to that uh, to what you just mentioned that you know people are benefiting is that from a coachy perspective, how do they evaluate whether my coach is good or not? Okay, this is this is a question which is a bit of a minefield. So I'm going to be uh, try and be careful how I answer it because I don't want to sound disparaging of anyone. Sure, sure. But uh, one of the reasons why, uh, and I didn't say it earlier because I, I, I you know, again, it's uh, it can be taken, it can be misinterpreted. Mm-hmm. But one of the reasons why coaching uh, did not take off earlier was because you did have a lot of people, and you still do. You ha- have a lot of people who um, who become coaches. Mm-hmm. but they are not coaches hmm. if you know what i mean they uh, so and and this is something that even in the training and the certification that i was given one of the things you know when you run a business you you run a business yeah. what do you look for you look for metrics right hmm. you want to see what's my roi going to be on this and the traditional answer to this question you know what am i going to get out of this how am i going to measure hmm. how good you are as a coach has been well you can't measure behavioral change hmm. and to an extent that's true correct but it's something that i don't agree with mm. and and i think i think this is a a, a very important um, so i know coaches i know i'm very i'm very clear about you know the goals that we said have to be measurable mm-hmm. uh, and uh, both the coachee the person being coached and the organization who's paying for it uh, they need to understand where the progress is being made and where the needle is moving correct. that accountability has to be there mm. So for me, uh, and that's why I said I have to be careful about here because I'm, I don't want to put anyone down. But I think uh, I think anyone getting coached must ask for accountability from the coach. Correct. That's very very important. Very well said. And one more question on coaching before I move to the next segment: How long should a coaching relationship be? So I I don't I I don't wouldn't recommend an up, upper limit. I know there's there are at least one or two people who I've been working for for about five to six years now. Okay. But uh, the thing about those relationships is it's not the same thing again and again. It's not every year we go back and revisit. So the first year it's something, then it's something else. The person is growing, and um, and and they're bigger. goals every time so a bigger and different goals so what we were doing say 5 years ago is very different from what we are working on now but those are very rare uh typically a coaching engagement i have a minimum cut off i i do not work with anyone for less than 12 months okay and one of the reasons for that is like i, I just talked about accountability uh i like to for me i am successful if i make myself redundant after the coaching engagement is over if the person says comes to me and says i can run on my own i i actually don't need your support anymore for me that's success 
Okay. And as a coach, and and therefore, twelve uh, months is I've I've realized is the optimal period where you can get sustainable results, hmm. where the coachee can then move uh, by themselves. They don't really need a coach okay. for that particular uh, you know set of goals. Understand? They might come up with another set of goals and say, yeah. "Hey, can you help me with that?" But uh, but yeah. that's yeah. Fair enough. So let's now move to a couple of questions for you personally. You did mention uh, something that you know. Uh, that could be seen as success. So that is a segue to my next question. That you know, very successful author, well recognized, successful corporate person, successful coach. What does success mean to Chris? This is a question which I, I I've grappled with this a lot. You know, I try to understand what I what I, I define as success and what makes uh, you know a, a person successful as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. And I, I've come to realize a couple of things. One is um, tradition, the way we look at success generally. Hmm. And I'm, I'm I'm using a very broad brush here. Yeah. But typically, it's it's looked as uh, you know uh, something that's very transient. Uh, when it, especially when it's connected to something that's material. Hmm. So uh, I'm a CEO today, so I'm I'm successful. I win an award today, so I'm successful. I produce a bestseller, and I'm successful. Hmm. And there, there are a couple of problems with this. One is, you know, we talk of the pinnacle of success. It's as if success comes in degrees. But for me, in my eyes, success is binary. Okay. Either you succeed or you fail. Hmm. And the second thing that I realized is that we tend to view and evaluate success through the eyes of other people, hmm. not necessarily through our own eyes. Hmm. And a lot of people don't are never satisfied because they're constantly trying to keep up with expectations and uh, you know and 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 show people what they're capable of doing. I think of success more as a journey than a destination. Mm-hmm. Um, as an author, I'm as good as my last book. Correct. Right. So uh, there's no guarantee my next book is going to be a bestseller. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a coach, I'm as good as my last engagement where I did something for someone. Correct. So I've come to view success as if I'm consistently true to my own values and principles, mm-hmm. I'm satisfied with that. Mm-hmm. I believe I'm successful. For me, that's success. Okay. And my last question to you now is uh, that if you, Chris, were a role model to millions of children, and I know you started writing because of your young daughter, and if these millions of children were closely following you and your life choices, what is the one thing you would change in yourself? Well, that's a tough question, um, Ashutosh. Because I think uh, whatever I've achieved and, you know, if I believe I've been successful in my own definition, as I've just told you, mm-hmm. uh, it's because of the life choices I've made. And, uh, and I think I've learned through my mistakes. Mm-hmm. So I cherish those mistakes because of the learning they've given me. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe what I would, I would change uh, if I was a role model for, for youngsters, I would probably be less impulsive. Okay. Uh, I've learned, and I am less impulsive now, mm-hmm. but I've been very impulsive uh, in in my younger days, and mm-hmm. you know, in uh, the early days of my career, mm-hmm. uh, taking decisions. Sometimes I have taken emotional decisions, mm-hmm. and uh, and I think I uh, that's something that uh, probably I would change because I would like people to watch me and say, okay, this is a guy who's. It's not about being risk averse, but it's about being sensible. Okay. And, uh, you know, and not letting emotions take, uh, you know, cloud your decision making at any point in time, because I think that's how we should be taking decisions, uh, not necessarily emotionally all the time. Wonderful. Chris, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. I wish you uh, the growth catalysts and of course, all your books, present and future, lots and lots of success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashutos. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for inviting me um, on this. Thank Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.